Hey folks, welcome to episode two of Sound Decisions. In this episode, we continue the interview with Rob Watts. This is part two of the episode. If you haven't watched part one, I do recommend going back and watching that first. Here in part two, Rob continues the conversation by discussing why he chose to design his DAX the way he did, or at least the beginning of that conversation. And most interestingly to me, we get into a conversation around how important levels of detail are right down into the sort of 300 to 350 decibel range of um, detail in the noise shapers that are built into the DAX. And Rob talks a bit about his findings in relation to that and how some of it doesn't necessarily make sense on paper, but absolutely plays out in what you listen to. I hope you enjoy it and I'll hand over now to Rob talking about the beginnings of his experiences moving into the world of DSD and Delta Sigma DAX. So we go back to um, the early 90s or rather 1989 when I first started to get the PDM chips from, from Philips. And they sounded, compared to R2R to R at that, that time, they sounded much more musical, much more involving emotionally. Um, the sound stage was deeper and it sounded warmer. Mm-hmm. So I, I was you know, really excited by it. But when I first started studying how PDM works or DSD works, having a one bit running with only 256 pulses, because that in those days it was 256, the SD 256 that you were using, only having 256 pulses. I couldn't see how you could get a 20 kilohertz signal to be accurately encoded with 120 dB dynamic range and only having 256 pulses. And that, that bothered me. So what I did was to um, have a, a product which was called the PDM 1024, and that used, I think it used four of these devices, or I may have used eight, I can't, can't remember. But I fed each individual DAC with a random source. And so you were randomizing the errors and improving the, the um, performance of the noise shaper by having four or eight of them mm-hmm. and summing the output together in the analog domain. What I noticed was the depth perception, the detail resolution did sound a lot better. Mm. So that kind of enforced, reinforced my view that you know, there wasn't enough pulses available to, to accurately reconstruct the signals. The other major issue that we had was that every single time we produced a DAC, they sounded different and they measured different. Right. And you, you'd have to tweak each individual DAC to get decent measurements before it be, be passed through. Delta Sigma DACs, um, sorry, DSD DACs are horribly sensitive to master clock jitter and they're horribly sensitive to parasitics because of your switching activity. So the thing about a DSD DAC or the disadvantage with DSD DAC is that your switching activity rate, like R2R DACs, varies with signal. Mm -hmm. So when you're reproducing zero, it's going backwards and forwards at a very fast rate. When it's reproducing fully positive, then the output just goes plus one. When it's reproducing fully negative, the output just goes to minus one. So there's mm-hmm. no switching activity yep. and it's going to the extremes. So as the signal gets larger, your amount of switching activity gets smaller. So that in turn creates um, issues with your, um, any clock jitter, any glitches that you get is gonna become signal dependent. That creates distortion. So that was another issue. The other issue is how sensitive it was to jitter. And DSD is very sensitive to master clock jitter. R2R DACs are also very, very sensitive to to master clock jitter. Um, So what I wanted to do was to have the benefits of DSD operation. And the benefit of a DSD operation is that you've got one element. So you've got one resistor. So you don't have any any having to match individual resistors Mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. I wanted that same benefit, but I wanted higher resolution. And I wanted to eliminate this signal switching activity coming up. So after pondering about about it and thinking up, I came up with a pulse array scheme. The beauty of a pulse array scheme is that it it has, um, for example, with your Q-test, you've got 10 elements. You've got 10 PWM switching elements. And they're arranged so that... um, one element will rise, the other element will fall. And so you get clock cancellation. So if there's clock jitter, nothing happens. So can in you fact, when the no- how that actually works? Because I've actually watched the video on the website a few times and it's still not clear to me what's triggering the rise and the fall and, and why, they, why they're rising and falling out of sync with one another, I guess was the, 
Well, 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 yeah, okay. Well, you just arrange it so that, let's say, for example, you're reproducing zero. Mm -hmm. um, and with a PWM structure, you'll have, um, in this case, you'll have five being positive and then five being zero. And then I have another element where I have five being zero and five being positive. And you, you arrange it so that they, they transit at the same time. Okay. So you get a crop cancellation effect. Um, okay. And um, the other benefit you have is that you, you make sure that your PWM, PWM is constantly switching at the same rate. The beauty of PWM is that if you're reproducing a small signal, then it will just go like this. And if you're reproducing a bigger, a zero signal, it will do that. And if you're reproducing a high signal, it'll do that. So the benefit of PWM is it's a constant switching activity. Mm. So it's always switching at exactly the same frequency. So your glitch energy becomes a DC component, a fixed level of noise. Okay. So we don't have the situation of glitch energy is changing the signal level, which creates noise hall modulation and creates distortion. But by keeping it so that it's constantly switching at exactly the same rate, we eliminate a major issue with it. Mm -hmm. The fact that we've got eight of them, or 10 of them with, with Q-test, sorry, is that it's, it's a high resolution signal. It's not one bit, it's a, it's a four bit signal. Yep. Um, and that improves your performance as well. Um, so you, you, you can encode much greater accuracy and much better small signals. Mm. The other thing that I do that's very different to conventional Delta Sigma is you need to understand how a noise shaper works. Um, it's a little bit complicated, but the way a noise shaper works is that you, you'll have, say, a 32-bit input coming in, and you'll have your output as being four or five bits, and your four or five bits will control a number of different switches. Um, in my case, they're controlling your pulse array um, elements, um, but you could be switching in different current sources or, or doing other different things. What then happens is if you're converting from 32 bits into four bits, you're going to have a 28-bit error because mm -hmm. you've lost the 28 bits. Mm -hmm. So what you do with that error, and if you were to not forget about that, you'd end up with 30-odd dB distortion and noise. So it would be okay. awful um, mm. distortion and noise performance. So what you do is you take those 28 bits, you feed it back, compare it to your input with a subtractor, and then you add some feedback by integrating the error. Um, and the clever thing about Delta Signal Noise Shapers is you have lots and lots of integrators. And they amplify up the error, and eventually the error becomes so large that it's, it will trigger one of your output switches on your four bit level. They will change state. That will create another error which then gets fed back. So this thing is a feedback loop. Okay. And the resolution and the performance of the feedback loop depends upon how fast you run the noise shaper. Just to clarify what Rob's saying here, and I'm gonna oversimplify it significantly, so apologies to the engineers in the world for how simple I'm about to make this. But essentially what Rob's saying is that the noise shaper is a system that, it's a little bit like noise cancelling headphones in the sense that it's identifying the noise, it's feeding that noise or the inverse of that noise back into the signal to cancel the noise out. And so that's where Rob's saying it depends on how fast they can run the, the many steps of that filtering process to get a really accurate representation of the noise and therefore filter it out correctly. Massive oversimplification, but that's the gist of it in terms of it being a feedback loop. It's what's the noise issue, can we reproduce it, and can we send it back on itself to cancel itself out? Imagine noise shapers only run at three megahertz. Um, so um, you've got a very low activity rate. That means you've got a lot of high frequency noise coming out. And it also means that your distortion and noise on the inbound performance is, is not very good. So I recognize that if you could run at a faster rate, you'd have much better resolution. It's, a, it's about making your resolution better. So in my case, we're looking at 2048 um, changes in, in the output from 44.1 kilohertz. Um, so it goes through that loop very much faster and you get much better distortion and noise performance. As time has gone by, the quality of your design tools have gotten better, so simulation mm -hmm. tools have been better. And now I can take my noise shaper, I can do what's called a Verilog simulation. So the beauty of a Verilog simulation, and they call it simulation, but it's not a simulation. It, it is, you put in some inputs, you get some outputs. They are exactly what will happen with the real hardware. So it's mm -hmm. not a simulation in that you're trying to model something. It is completely accurate. Right. Of what's 
So you can put in a sine wave and then you can extract your data output and then you can run that through an FFT and you can do some measurements. Um, in the past, I could run with, you know, PC tools were so poor, you'd, you'd have one millisecond's worth of output and that would take you all day to do. Mm -hmm, wow. Um, now I can do 50 milliseconds of, of audio output and it'll take half an hour. Okay. So you can, you can do 4 million point FFTs, you can do even larger FFTs. So FFT, you can really what, analyze. Sorry, what, sorry? FFT, what do FFT stand for? Okay, FFT. When you see distortion plot, you'll see the one kilohertz fundamental, mm -hmm. you'll see the noise floor, you see all the distortion. To create that plot, you're using an FFT, which is a fast Fourier transform. Okay. So it converts your um, analog signal into frequency bins so you can see what each individual harmonic's doing. Gotcha. So it's, it's the key for extracting information on how this thing is measuring. When I was, um, if you'd asked me this question, how good a noise shaper does it need to be? Sort of 10 years ago, I would have said, all you need is a 200 dB noise shaper. Because 200 dB, that's 32 bit accurate. There's no way you'll ever get your analog section to be 32 bit accurate, 200 dB noise performance is never going to happen. Mm. You're never going to get distortion at that level. So I always felt that 200 dB was good enough. <clears throat> um, and DAC64, the QBD76, these all had 200 dB noise shapers. Conventional chip DACs, the best of them are only 140 dB. Mm. So they're actually quite poor at reproducing small signals. And this has a problem because if you cannot re reproduce your small signals accurately enough, then your perception of depth gets degraded. And detail resolution and depth gets degraded. So to make a noise shaper work, you have to run at much higher rates than a standard chip DAC. But when I was designing Hugo One, I noticed something very strange. <clears throat> and I got really good sound quality performance with the first prototype of Hugo One. I was very excited by it when I first heard it. And, but I hadn't added crossfeed function. So I needed to add the crossfeed function, but at that time I was using 95% of the device. The crossfeed was gonna make it go over 100%. So I had to put the design on a diet and slim it down. It was still a 200 dB noise shaper, but it was fundamentally simpler and, and different to the first noise shaper. Ran a listening test, and I was expecting it to sound worse and then worrying about what the hell I was going to do if it did sound worse, how I would recover the performance. And it was rather strange. It actually sounded better. And the perception of depth and detail resolution was better. So this was really weird mm. because just changing something at minus 200 dB, that shouldn't make a difference to the sound. Um, but when I came to designing Dave, which is the uh, top of the range DAC, um, I had a huge FPGA and this was 10 times larger and it meant that I could explore this, this, this avenue and test my assumption that a 200 dB noise shaper was good enough. So I created a better noise shaper, it was 220 dB and listened to it and indeed depth got better mm. um, and I kept this process going until I could no longer hear a change. And after about three months of, in, of designing on, on, on this and playing around with all this, I got to the final solution, which was a 330 dB against 350 dB. And even at that level, you could still hear a subtle change in the perception of depth. It was very small by comparison to the 200 to 220 dB, but you could still hear a change. So this was really crazy. Um, and um, what it meant was, was that it doesn't matter with depth and detail resolution. If there is an error, it doesn't matter how small that error is, you will be able to hear the change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Trouble is, is these numbers are so incredibly small. Mm -hmm. 200 dB to 350 dB. I mean, when you look at the performance of a noise shaper at minus 100 dB, you're looking at 0 0.10 is 1 dB change. Wow. These are just, just, incredibly small mm -hmm. and to, for me to say this level of performance is important i could easily get branded as a complete lunatic <laughs> yeah, because absolutely. it is crazy that we could easily hear these levels of mm. shift um and it's really really weird and to some extent 
I don't understand why the brain is so sensitive, but then depth perception, um, we know the cues that the brain uses for, for depth perception, but the brain is so incredible in terms of how it calculates where an instrument is located in space. Mm -hmm. Don't really understand how the brain manages to do that. Um, so um, if we don't understand how the brain does it, then you, you can't make assertions as to whether something's going to be audible or not. Audible. Yeah, and to what level of sensitivity it, it works. Yeah. yeah. But I was, I was afraid that of publishing these numbers and people, you know, the, the objectionists, mm. objectivist type, scientific type people saying this guy's a lunatic because he's saying that you need better than 200 dB when all we need is 140 dB. Um, from a distortion noise point of view. Yeah. Um, and I thought, oh, sod it. I've done so many listening tests and I could consistently hear it. These were my observations. People don't believe me, then that's their problem. It's not my problem. That's right. Yeah. So I, I decided just to, just to give the numbers out and, and, you know, just talk about it. Yeah. And I think that's great so, because it opens up, you know, that there's a lot, and I think I mentioned this in my email to you, there's a lot of, um, division in in the online communities of audio around yes. does and does not make a difference and i think i personally think it's really important for us to be really open-minded about there's lots of things we can measure and that we do understand but there are still yeah. lots of things like the um this level of sensitivity to those subtle changes and subtle sounds there's lots that we still don't fully understand about how the brain does what it does what it can Absolutely. perceive what it can't perceive so i think it's great that that conversation's out there I hope you enjoyed part two of the interview with Rob Watts. There is at least one more part to come. I'm, I'm working out as I go through how many pieces to chunk this into, but there's at least one more part, maybe two to come. So if you're enjoying these so far, do remember to subscribe and hit the bell so you see when the next one comes up. As we get closer to Christmas, I'm not sure the exact timing of when these will release, and I do have a couple of reviews that I want to post in the meantime. So stay tuned, keep an eye out, and I'll look forward to seeing you here next time on Passion for Sound.